Well, hi and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's training, the training Introduction to Geospatial Data by the Data Europa Academy. I'm very happy to see so many of you with us today, and I am very excited, and I hope you are uh, as well. My name is Laura von Kippenberg, and I am part of the Data Europa team. And in my role, I specifically focus on supporting EU institutions and member states in their open data practices. I will be your host uh, today and facilitate the session together with Esther Huya and the Data Europa team's uh, geospatial experts, uh, Antje Kugler and Simon Jirka. Um, can I please ask you to introduce yourselves uh, to the audience so that they also get to know uh, you a little bit? Um, Esther, would you like to go next? Thank you very much. Um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, great to have you. My name is Esther Huy. I'm a senior manager at Capgemini Invent and the project leader of data.europa.eu. And I'm very happy to see so many people here today and, of course, our geospatial experts who will introduce us to geodata today. OK, I'll just move on. My name is Antje Kugler. And I work for Conterra, uh, which is a company based in Germany with local offices in uh, Spain and Germany. At Conterra, we focus on integrating geoinformation on our, into our customers' workflows and IT structures. And my team and I are responsible for the geospatial dimension of data.europa.eu. And we share this responsibility with 52 North. And uh, that's why I'd like to introduce uh, Simon Jirka, who prepared this webinar together with me. And uh, Simon is one of 52 North's general managers. 52 North is a nonprofit organization uh, devoted to spatial information research. They support open science through open data and open source software. And for this webinar, where we are being supported by um, Christian Ottermann from 52 North and uh, Jan van Sadler from Conterra, who will be helping us uh, answering any questions uh, you might have. Yes, and we are very happy to give you an introduction on geospatial data, its value, and how to find such data on data.europa.eu. And we're really excited to find out about your thoughts and ideas in the interactive part of this course. Great, thank you very much, uh, Antje and Esther. Uh, so indeed, we have an exciting topis, uh, topic before us today, which is geospatial data. And indeed, as Antje already mentioned, the goal of this training is to actually have a basic understanding of geospatial data and uh, an understanding of the location components of data that can be very valuable. And to do that, the agenda for today is as follows. As this is the first training of the Data Europa Academy, we will start with an introduction of the new DataEuropa.eu portal and the, and the Academy specifically. Uh, then we will introduce uh, geospatial data and show you or demo how to find it on the data.europa.eu portal. Then after a short break, uh, Antje will demo how to access and use geospatial data that is available on Data Europa, uh, and also uh, combining non-geo data with geo data. And after another five minute break, uh, we will discuss a little bit more in detail. Uh, we will have a Q&A and a summary of the training as well as the closing of the session, which will include a feedback survey. And in between uh, today's session, we will also have a few interactive elements to discuss the questions that we asked you to prepare in advance of this meeting. Now, before we really get into it, uh, I just wanted to uh, discuss with you some rules of the game. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, this training will be recorded to enable everyone who is not able to join today to also get the insights that are shared. Um, I will also ask you to mute yourselves during the training to obviously avoid um, background noises that may be disrupting. At the end of the training, please, please let us know uh, your thoughts, uh, uh, how you liked it and help us to improve by filling in our feedback form, which will only take a few minutes. And 
lastly, in case you have any questions, we are very happy to, to answer them, to discuss them. And as we know that not everyone may be, uh, may be able to access the chat, we will use a tool Slido to gather everyone's questions. And this tool also allows for voting on the questions. Um, so let's say someone else put in a question and you can vote on that question if you find uh, if you find it interesting and would also like to know the answer. And this will help us to prioritize the questions to discuss. And if you prefer, you are also free to, during the Q&A part of the session at the end of the training, uh, unmute yourself and ask your questions directly. Now, a quick note on Slido in case you have not used it before. You can use your mobile phone or another device uh, to go to the browser and go to sly.do and on the home page you will see uh, as you can see here on the left uh, the the blue box saying joining as a participant where you can fill in a code which is the word uh, cute special and that will bring you to the page that you can see here on the right hand side where you can post your questions and where we will use the the poll to discuss the questions that we ask you to prepare in advance. I believe that is all we need to know before going into the introduction of the DataEuropa.eu portal, um, for which I will now hand over the floor to Esther. Thank you, Laura. Indeed, before we focus on geodata, um, we would like to introduce you or reintroduce you to data.europa.eu official portal for EU open data, funded and managed by the Publications Office of the European Union and DG Connect from the Commission. And some of you might have the feeling this service has been around for many years. Um, and in many ways, you're right. Um, Data.europa.eu was launched in April of this year and in combines two services that have been around indeed for many years, the EU open data portal and the European data portal. And some of you might even remember that there was a certain level of confusion about what is the difference between the two. Um, and I think we're all very happy that we do no, no longer need to explain the difference because now data.europa.eu is indeed the one official portal for European data. On the portal, EU institutions and EU member states make available their data to citizens. Beyond providing access to data, Data.Europa also supports data providers in publishing data and all the questions that come with it. For example, how to select data, um, what about data and metadata, quality, vocabulary, standards, data rights, licensing. We also measure annually the open data maturity uh, in Europe to learn from best practices, understand challenges and evolve together. Thirdly, data.Europa.eu also engages with the community and research and disseminates open data trends. We want to learn from use cases out there and we also measure the socioeconomic impact created by reusing open data. And all aspects among these efforts um, that have something to do with learning, skill development, research um, and knowledge creation are under the umbrella of the Data.Europa Academy. And Laura will tell you more about that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so Esther already mentioned it. Uh, at, at the one, on the one hand, uh, providing support to the member states and civil servants and EU institutions via trainings and workshops is not something new, uh, but creating a clear overview of all of the training material that we have available, uh, as well as the trainings that will be offered in the future is something new, and that is what we call the Data Europa Academy. And this uh, Data Europa Academy really serves you, uh, the open data community, in becoming more knowledgeable uh, about open data. Uh, and the goal is to really support and empower all EU institutions and member states with publishing open data that is of high quality and lives up to the legal and tech technical standards. Now, in this academy, you can learn about open data discoverability and publication, also different types of data such as geodata, uh, interoperability standards, uh, as well as regulatory and uh, 
than technical requirements or recommendations. In addition, the Academy also covers topics related to open data reuse, uh, such as best practices, and also topics such as measuring open data impact. Now, in the curriculum of the Data Europa Academy, you can find all the available courses that we have right now. And these courses are either offered by datareuropa.eu or have components from other EU institutions. Now, to help you find the right course for you, the curriculum is structured along four themes, uh, which are policy, impact, technology and quality. And these four themes cover a variety of topics uh, that are considered to be essential for open data publication and reuse. And they are also the same themes that are used in the in the in the benchmarking uh, research that Esther already mentioned, which is the uh, open data, uh, which is the annual open data maturity assessment. And you can also uh, filter the curriculum uh, then based on these themes and your interest. Um, in addition, this in addition to what is available right now. Uh, the curriculum is also constantly updated uh, with new courses uh, and new learning materials such as uh, trainings, webinars, but also uh, reports uh, based on new practices and new insights. And for this, we also uh, would really like to learn or hear from you. Uh, so please also tell us what you think uh, or what you maybe miss in the curriculum. Uh, via the feedback button in the Academy page. Now the Academy is launched since this Monday, uh, and so you can now explore the Academy at uh, data.europa.eu slash Academy. And I would say that that is uh, that covers the introduction to data.europa.eu as well as the Academy. And I'd say we'd get started with the topic of today, which is, of course, geospatial data. And as a first exercise and to see if everyone is able to use uh, Slido, uh, please uh, go to go to the website slide.do and enter geospatial as the code. I believe it is also just pasted in the in the chat, uh, so you can also click on the link in the chat. And here we would like to ask you, I see many people have already started, which is great, uh, to uh, please let us know in which country you are in right now. Please use the English uh, spelling of your country. And this will give us a nice overview from where everyone is joining today. <laughs> I see some run from Venus. That's so interesting, uh, but I see a lot of people from the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, France. I also see Italy, Romania. Right, great. And as we are collecting the input, uh, please feel free to still uh, continue to add your input while I will hand over to Antje. Um, thank you, Lara. Oh, this is, let's, let's keep watching this for a bit. <laughs> it's quite interesting to see where you're all coming from. Uh, about 77 uh, participants have already entered, so we can probably have a look at this later again. Uh, and wouldn't it have been nice to see all that on, on a map? You know, some information is, is um, just more easy to grasp if you see it on a map. And uh, this is because a lot of data actually has a location component. And location, of course, is easier to understand when it's visualized on a map. But it's not just about mapping or visualizing things, but um, when uh, looking at the geospatial context, um, the, the where of a phenomenon, um, this will often uncover interesting correlations or relevations. Re uh, and I'm actually hoping that this will be the, the main takeaway uh, that, that you have from this course to understand um, where to basically look for geospatial context and to understand how, how to, to use it to, um, for more exploration for analysis. 
Um, let me just give you an example. Uh, Germany had its national election last Sunday. And I think the most interesting question right after, so who won or how did the individual parties do, was how did people vote in my city, you know, location or my state maybe, or maybe some some other place that that I'm um, that is of in, of personal interest to me. And also, um, this, this is a more, more a bit of uh, analysis. Um, where did people vote for certain parties? And um, that's been um, this is um, election data is uh, is data that's been open data. Um, traditionally for, for a long time because it's so useful and because people are so interested in it and uh, want to do different things with it. And so it, it's good to have this, this uh, raw open data. Let's talk a bit about geospatial data types. There are different ways to represent the same geographic feature. And the main difference, and this is um, uh, something that's sometimes difficult to understand for, for people who work with uh, geodata for the first time. Uh, there's a difference between vector data and raster data. Raster data is, is image data. You probably, it's, it's basically uh, data like um, remote sensing data you get from satellites or uh, stuff you, you see on, on Google Maps when, when you see the uh, autophotography. And um, the, the main difference here is um, that uh, vector data actually includes geographical objects, usually points or lines or polygons, which are basically areas. Um, and while raster data is a collection of, of pixels, um, with each individual pixel encoding information for its immediate location. And geodata usually includes coordinates of a phenomenon. So for vector data, we call this geometry. And the geospatial aspect can either be direct, which we'll be talking about first. This would be by including coordinates, for example, or uh, the geospatial aspect could be indirect by including an address or postal code or uh, an in identifier of a municipality or, uh, or a country. And this is the thing we'll talk about these, these indirect references later. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this later and um, have, an, uh, have a demo and some, um, uh, some, some exercises on that. So let's move to the geospatial formats, the real geospatial data um, data formats that include um, uh, that that include uh, these these coordinates and the uh, georeferencing information. Um, so this is just a list of um, of formats that you might come across or you may already know. Um, a very popular one because it's it's. Uh, quite old as I think it's from the beginning of the 90s or even older uh, is a shapefile, um, which is a format uh, that was developed by a commercial company Esri, uh, but they um, they um, published the specification of shapefile. So it's um, it could be seen as an open format because it's it's so widely used and um, uh, you can basically import it into any any um, geographical information system um, called a GIS. Uh, another um, format I'd like to talk about is uh, GeoJSON. Um, GeoJSON uh, is um, a format that's um, becoming more and more popular um, because it's easily used on the web. Um, you probably know JSON is um, a, a data structure that's that's very uh, commonly used in in web development. Um, then we have GPX, which you, would, the ones of you who have a fitness tracker and who who download the data might might know this this format because it's uh, usually uh, comes from. Uh, uh, 
yeah, any um, any device that uh, that uses uh, GPS and that will uh, export this data. It's usually done in uh, as GPX. Then we have geocode. And um, this is actually the first uh, raster uh, data uh, format that I mentioned. The other ones were all uh, vector data. And uh, this embeds the georeferencing information in a TIFF file. So you, you might be um, uh, uh, familiar with uh, TIFF files. It's, it's an image uh, format. And this, this uh, is a spe uh, the special uh, thing about this is that it actually includes the georeferencing uh, information. Then we have geo package I'd like to mention, which is an open format which supports both raster and vector data. That's that's actually quite quite unusual. And then the, the last two um, formats I'd like to mention are uh, XML uh, implementations. Uh, one's GML, geographic markup language, and you'll see a lot of that uh, on the um, uh, on data.europa.eu. And um, uh, the last format I'd like to uh, point out is uh, KML, Keyhole Markup Language, uh, which was developed by Google for Google Maps and Google Earth, and is actually uh, now an open standard published by um, a standards organization called the OGC. So the last four formats on this um, on this slide: GeoTIFF, GeoPackage, GML, and KML are all uh, open standards published by the main standards organization for geoinformation. And that's the OGC, Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, which is a worldwide community committed to improving access to geospatial or location information. And it's, it's basically um, the most important um, standardization organization if you're looking at Geo information. And I'd like to talk about one special thing about um, geospatial information or geospatial data, and that's that um, uh, the, this uh, data is often delivered uh, via services, via geo services, we call them. Um, so it's not just uh, or on, on data.europa.eu, you will not just only find data that can be downloaded as a zip file or um, just um, as, a, as a file, but also data that's being delivered via services. So it's basically a, a URL that can be accessed in, in a certain way, uh, a URL endpoint, uh, I might say. And uh, some example of the, uh, some of uh, examples of this uh, that you'll come across are web map services or WMS for short, web map tile services, which is WMTS, web feature services, WFS, and OGC API features. And uh, one thing to to understand about these geo services is. Um, uh, that you will also find um, variations of these different services um, because of um, the INSPIRE directive. And um, the INSPIRE directive, you've probably heard, heard of it if you're uh, working with data and uh, you're living in Europe. Uh, the INSPIRE directive is to promote sh the sharing of geospatial data. And uh, the um, Inspire View and Download services are basically OGC standards extended for Inspire requirements. So um, uh, the Inspire uh, initiatives um, has things called uh, technical guidances, which uh, will basically ex explain or um, give give more details uh, on on how to. Uh, set up and deliver um, OGC services. So the goal here is, of course, not to uh, give you an in-depth understanding um, uh, of geo services, but it would be good if you just generally, uh, if you see WMS or WFS, uh, you might remember that it's a geo service that will deliver dynamic content.
Okay. So let's move on to putting this into practice and let's have a look at how we can find some of those formats and geoservices on data.europa.eu. For this, I'm starting a browser. And as I don't know how familiar you are with uh, data.europa.eu, I'll just start from the beginning. Uh, the uh, data.europa.eu harvests metadata from national and regional open data portals and geoportals, or you could call them catalogs. Um, geoportals um, are usually often also called um, geocatalogs. And um, I'm here on the starting page of data.europa.eu and I'll click on catalogs. There are many different um, ways to start a search. I'm starting one from the catalog to demonstrate what kind of data we can uh, we can expect basically. And here on the left, uh, you see a filter uh, for countries. First one is actually not a country, but uh, the EU institutions. And then we have countries. And um, you'll notice most of the countries here have two catalogs. And that's usually because it's one geo portal. Or that's, <laughs> I'm always putting the geo first. So it's one open data portal and one, uh, one geo portal. And let's have a look at one. But you see they, uh, a lot of them have, uh, have two. Some of them have um, only one, of course, that, that might be that the geodata is already included in the open data portal or that it's not, not considered as, as important. But um, let's have a look at one of these um, countries' um, catalogs that are being uh, harvested. And I'm going to Luxembourg. Um, and so here we have uh, two portals being harvested. One's the open data portal of Luxembourg and once the geodata portal of Luxembourg. And because we are interested in geodata now, and I want to show you some, some uh, different kind of formats in, in action, how to, to download it, I'll click on the geo portal because uh, I'm more likely to find the, um, um, the geodata in this, this area. So uh, I have 364 data sets that are being found here. That's, that's all the um, data that's being harvested from, um, from um, the Luxembourg um, GeoPortal. And uh, I will look at some, some more filters here. If you scroll down a bit uh, to the left, I have a filter for formats. Um, and this is actually quite nice because all of these, these formats are um, uh, actually um, um, some, somehow related to uh, geo information. Uh, with zip, of course, you can tell because um, you don't know what's, what's in the zip file. But uh, here we have uh, GML that we just talked about. That's this uh, XML format, which is um, used a lot, or, uh, or the, it's, it's the main uh, encoding used for um, inspired data. Then we have WFS which was the web feature service. So that's one of the geo services. WMS, which is the um, uh, web map services uh, service I talked about. Uh, and then we have Esri Shape we talked about. Uh, XML, we'll have to have a look what, what exactly it is. PDF, probably some, some, um, uh, some, some maps uh, in an, uh, pe uh, pe layouted in a map. Uh, in, a, uh, in a PDF. TIFFs we talked about and CSV might be something including um, geo information. Um, so let's have a look at, at one of these services and I'm choosing WMS because WMS uh, is, is one of the uh, two things that can actually be visualized in um, in data.europa.eu. Um, data.europa.eu um, offers a kind of preview for geovisualization, so you can have a look at um, what's, what's being offered. And um, you can visualize these WMS services. So let's first look at um, what's offered here. 
Um, so this data actually um, is um, published um, because of uh, the INSPIRE directive and it's uh, the theme is geology. And so let's have a look at this. I could um, um, of course have, have links. Oops, uh, didn't want to click there. Um, so I need to link back. Um, if I want to do the visualization, I'll just um, click on options and open geo visualization. And now I get this service on uh, geology being added to the map. And I have um, these, these WMS usually have, um, have layers there and the information is organi organized in, in layers, um, which could correspond to basically, basically data, um, data sets. So, and here's one on um, the surface geology. And I can have a look at the um, at the legend and understand what's what's being uh, displayed here. So that's the WMS and looking at um, the different um, the different uh, data formats. There's a second data format I'd like to point out and uh, have a closer look at, and that's um, that's GeoJSON. And um, I'm going to use a different approach at searching this time. I'm going to search for um, a data set um, that's called who is who. And um, I'm going to put the scope for EU data. And um, this is actually the um, the data set I would like to um, I would like to have a closer look at. But let's first um, look at the uh, at the formats here. So um, we have a list of, of formats in this case. There um, there's only one geo uh, there's only one uh, geo format in this list, and that's GeoJSON. I'm going to click it. So this is the metadata set or the, the data set I want to have a look at. And um, when you look at this, um, there's um, a whole lot of different distributions, different um, uh, different uh, data types being um, um, being offered here. And the one I'm looking for, need to scroll down a bit. So there's actually a lot of HTML. The one I'm looking for is um, GeoJSON. And uh, it shows the sites and buildings of EU institutions all over the world. And GeoJSON is um, another format, uh, is the second format then that can be used um, and visualized uh, within data.europa.eu. So I'll do that. I'll add it. The map. And so in this case, you see it's a wild uh, worldwide um, data set. So I'm I'm zooming to to all of uh, all of the world. And so let's go to to Luxembourg. You see those those pink um, buildings. You see if you're familiar with Luxembourg, you see uh, Kirchberg, and then you have the individual um, the individual um, buildings that that can also um, be looked at. So this is this shows it's actually data. So if I down, downloaded this um, this GeoJSON, I would get um, this information plus the um, the coordinates of, of these um, of these polygons. So that's um, that will um, the end of this per first part of the uh, of the demonstration, and you can probably have a look at Slido to see if there are any questions. And now, Laura, or can someone tell me if there are any questions yet? Yes, of no. course. There were uh, two questions in the 
in the chat by Julius mm -hmm. and by Carlos. These already have been have been answered. And I believe mm -hmm. when we look at the questions in Slido, mm -hmm. there is a uh, Two. Uh, the first one is: Is there a specific method to discover geospatial datasets on dataeuropa.eu, and are there specific filters that should be used? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, um, specific filters. Um, there's no specific filter to. Um, let me just move move back to. Um, uh, there's there's no specific filter um, to uh, to go straight to um, uh, to to just get geodata because the geodata is is a format and uh, uh, it's it are different form could be different formats and um, with the um, this uh, who is who um, buildings example for example you saw there was both geodata as geojson and there was also um, other um, things like um, HTML and PDFs and things like that. So um, there's no um, filter to to basically um, look for geodata. But uh, what you could do is um, basically, if you know know what uh, geo what what types of formats is geodata, you you would set your um, your filter here. So if you're looking for WMS. Or any of the formats I um, I explained earlier. This is uh, where you um, how you would go about it. Okay. Nice. Great. So I think that covers uh, the question. There's a few uh, more questions. Maybe we can ah, okay. go into one of them and uh, leave the others for the for the Q and A part. Uh, yeah, I it just move. Uh, back to the presentation so we can actually see them. If uh, it is asked if it's possible to use geospatial data for analyzing patterns of people movement. The person that wrote it says I am thinking to COVID-19 tracing of mobilities during confinement periods. Mm -hmm. Um, that's actually a great, great idea, um, and it's it's possible. Um, uh, the the German um, the German uh, statistics organization uh, Distatus is actually doing exactly that. They've got a um, they've got a very interesting, it's more like an experimental portal, and uh, they're doing exactly that. Uh, they're using. Um, uh, data from um, from um, the the mobile phone companies, and uh, of course, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, an anonymous data, but uh, they are using exactly that to um, to track um, uh, to track movement and to see how many people were actually in in one area at a given time. Nice. Thanks for uh, for your answer. And then uh, I would say there is also a question by anonymous if this is open for EU for non EU member states as well. Um, so, what do you mean by the the, the harvesting? That is that's unclear. Yeah. Yeah. The um, well, the um, data.europa.eu harvests uh, specific catalogs. And uh, actually, that's a question for you, Laura. Yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah. If uh, if if the question is if the if we also harvest non-EU member states, that is uh, true. We also uh, harvest uh, other countries that are not EU member states. Yeah. All right. And then. I would say uh, some of the other questions we can discuss in more detail during the Q&A. Mm -hmm. OK, great. So in that case, let's uh, move on to the second poll. Um, let's move on to 
the second hall. And uh, the idea here is to, um, to uh, discuss what kind of questions uh, could be used um, using, uh, could be answered using geospatial data. And the idea here is uh, to reflect on, um, yes, what, uh, what on the usefulness of, of geospatial data and uh, where you could, where you could actually um, um, need it and, and what, what questions could be um, used to answer it. So, um, to consider for what uh, geodata can be useful, we'd like to, to ask you which questions could be answered using geospatial data. Just input that uh, information, yeah, something like that. And uh, it may help you to think about topics either from work, which will probably uh, include some, some kind of analysis, but it could also be um, uh, your private interests. So maybe you have just bought a camper van and you're planning a trip and uh, would be important. What would be important for you to decide on a place to stay? Or maybe you're interested in water sports um, such as canoeing or, or stand up paddling and you're looking for new places for your hobby. So, yeah, but I see you're already inputting some uh, some some ideas. The one with the closest toilets is pretty good <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. yeah, that seems very helpful. <laughs> All right, I see some good suggestions coming in. This kind of input is actually really interesting for us uh, in preparation for, for demos or in, in analysis to to think about what, what people are interested in and what, what we could have a closer look at. Like I was I was just thinking um, this this one about the dark skies, what kind of if there's actually data on, on dark skies or if I would uh, have to somehow create it myself by looking at um, um, for example agglomeration of cities and uh, and um, where uh, streets, main streets are and then somehow um, make an analysis from that. So these are really interesting inputs. Mm -hmm. We were actually having uh, planning to have a break, um, a short break, um, five minute break. So um, Laura, should we just leave this this open? Um, for, for people also to look at. And I, I believe you can also um, see this in, in your own Slido and if you're not using the presenting, uh, presenting um, like I'm here now. And mm -hmm. so let's have a five minute break now. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, oh, maybe before we go into the break, uh, we have a final question coming in from uh, Julius. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the difference between geospatial and georeference data? That is um, the first part of the question. <laughs> and the second mm -hmm. part is if you agree that almost to all data uh, it is possible to attribute with spatial parameters. Um, yes, I would agree to that. Um, the, uh, basically, when we talk about geodata, it's uh, geo and uh, spatial reference data. Um, when, when I think about it, it's usually the same thing. Uh, there might be um, this, uh, a way to distinguish between um, if it has a direct, um, if it has a direct um, um, spatial reference like coordinates, then it would be uh, georeference data. And if not, um, so if, it, uh, if we uh, do the referencing via um, an indirect um, thing like uh, postal codes or 
carrier um, IDs or something like that, then it could be, um, uh, yeah, just geodata. But but I'm I'm actually not sure if there's a if there's a real definition for it. So if I I use that, um, I meant the same thing. If I use that term. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I guess that answered uh, your question. All right, then I would say uh, we go into a short break uh, for now. Let's meet back in uh, in five minutes. So at 10, 20, 26. All right, see you in a bit. All right. I hope that everyone been able to get a quick, uh, quick quick drink or coffee or something then I believe we can continue okay great I've done some reading <laughs> in the meantime it's it's really interesting um, let's just take uh, take a few minutes to to scroll through um, the the ideas and the answers what what questions could be answered using geospatial data um, so the first one must have been quicker, quickest. I'm, I'm not sure if there's also an upvoting uh, um, thing that you can can vote for different answers, but uh, in any case, we're just um, scrolling through like this. How neighboring buildings are shading a house you plan to buy. My favorite functionality on my National Geo portal. I can imagine that it really shows the um, shows the, the, um, the, the benefit of, um, of using this kind of data. Energy saving buildings at a country level. That sounds interesting. Mm. Perception of the EU. Cross information on social economic indicators and EU actions. Definitely interesting. Ocean floor mapping. Green area distance from home and cities. Yeah, that's interesting. Population density, type of soil for construction purposes, for example. Yeah, this house buying or house building, uh, there, there are a lot of things that would um, make, make uh, geo data or geo information uh, interesting for um, new homeowners. Uh, oh yeah, the next one's <laughs> right there. Show property prices in in different regions. Where are people going for their Erasmus and mobility period? Definitely something I'd be interested in. Uh, I think they also have a thing on uh, Erasmus babies. How many babies were born in different places of the EU? That would, would be quite quite interesting to have a look at. The percentage of population in a given area living 15 minutes or one kilometer far from a bus uh, or railroad station. Yeah, I can see that being interesting also for, for uh, planning of mobility or traffic. When you're moving place, where's your ideal place to live? Air pollution. Yeah, also interesting if you're moving to a place, is there air pollution there? Are there regional differences? Mapping census data. Sorry, yes? the, the air pollution is actually something that a friend of mine is uh, really actively checking mm. when deciding mm. on where to live. Yeah. Ah, OK. Um, it's also an interesting thing for citizen science. I think a lot of um, um, people are um, engaging in, in that kind of activity. Um, it's also um, uh, the, the Inspire Directive has has, uh, has a few things, and, and generally there's there's a lot of um, um, uh, a lot of um, uh, the member states uh, have to report a lot of data on that, and most of this is made made uh, open data. Okay, how many have we got here? We can probably spend spend the rest of the <laughs> of the. <laughs> The meeting. I'll just scroll through it uh, quite just slowly for people to read with with us. Demographic information. Where do people over 65 years live? Unemployment rate. Yes, that's definitely interesting. The toilet, the closest toilet. 
What is the EU fund and where? That's definitely interesting. Where does the money go? That's that's an open data question that's uh, very, um, well, of, of great interest. Um, generally finances and where's money being spent. And this would be literally where, not for what, but where as well. Yeah. Risk areas, yes, pollution, seismic, geological, also a thing when you're moving places, I guess. Mm -hmm. How much EU money is invested in uh, each country in region? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this one. Where is it? Exactly. Anything really. <laughs> I'm hiking and I'm lost. How to find back to the hotel? Yeah, that's a classic. Hope, hoping mm -hmm. that's not from personal experience. <laughs> also hoping you don't need to find open data to, to do this and do some geospatial analysis. Um, yeah. The, EU doing and funding in my region. That's a that's a real uh, of real interest. It's, it's I think that's the third time I've seen it. Mm -hmm. And also the the thing with the traffic and mobility. Mm -hmm. Spatial dynamics of a disease spread. That's definitely a, a very it's a classic uh, uh, GIS uh, uh, geospatial analysis um, topic location of wildfires and so on. OK, I think uh, we've got a very good overview. Lots of lots of ideas uh, for um, which question could be answered uh, using geospatial data. And uh, what we'd like to do now is. Um, is uh, have a closer look at how to access and use geospatial data. And um, we're going to um, be, be looking at one question that, that could be answered um, using uh, geospatial data. Um, a geodata usually uh, includes coordinates of a phenomenon. For vector data, we call this geometry. And uh, the geospatial data formats that um, we, we talked about earlier usually include coordinates and uh, they can be used in a geographical information system, uh, GIS. Um, but when we discuss the contents of this um, um, on this uh, training um, with um, uh, the publication uh, office earlier and, and the European Commission earlier, um, um, we decided that using a GIS is, uh, would be far beyond the scope of the training and uh, that we shouldn't, shouldn't basically have a look at a, um, um, how, to, how to do with this with a specific GIS. But uh, what we do want to show you is uh, what to do if the data you want to display or you want to work with in a GIS maybe, um, contains no coordinates if it's not uh, direct, uh, if it's, it's not a, a, a geodata format. And um, we may be you, uh, able to use uh, indirect geospatial uh, information that's uh, included in the, uh, in the data, such as addresses or postal codes or um, municipality identifier. And this is uh, the case a lot with open data. If we're thinking of, um, of election data um, or uh, statistics. Uh, these often uh, include some kind of um, um, identifier. For example, um, just the, the area that uh, the data relates to, if, if it's statistical data. Um, but it doesn't include the geometry itself, the, the geo information. Um, so um, let's just go ahead and find an interesting data set to work on. And I'll do that again. Go to uh, data.europa.eu. And 
I'm going to search for some data. And um, the topic we thought about uh, looking for is um, COVID-19 because the um, COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the uh, necessity of open data, of raw data, because we, we especially at the beginning, we got lots of um, PDFs and nice maps and things, or just lists of, uh, of, of um, um, yeah, people uh, being infected or people dying. Um, but uh, uh, the, the value and the necessity of open data became very clear when, um, yeah, very, basically very different um, people, even private people or companies uh, or organizations started working with the data and creating dashboards, creating, um, making something from, from the data and just analyzing it. And um, so now there are thousands of dashboards, diagrams, maps, and so on around using that open data. Um, but uh, the COVID-19 pandemic also showed us the importance of geo-information, like where is other things actually happening and also showed us what uh, that uh, data literacy is very important um, so i'll just search for COVID 19. there's actually quite a lot of data um, on this uh, in, in data.europa.eu um, and um, yeah let me just say the second reason we are um, using this example is that sadly over the last one and a half years most of us have probably become experts when it comes to COVID-19 numbers because we hear about them all the time and um, so um, we believe that this this data is help, hopefully quite quite easy to to grasp so I just looked for um, COVID-19 I find lots and lots of data sets, but I want to uh, set the scope to EU data. And the one here right on top seems promising. I'll click on the details. So it's the COVID-19 coronavirus data weekly update from December 2020. And the publisher is the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. So that seems like um, a trustworthy and uh, competent source of, of this data. And here I have, um, again, uh, many different distributions. Um, Excel, XML, JSON, CSV, HTML, RSS, and, and so on. But you might notice uh, there's no geo format here or none that that would uh, be be obvious here. Um, I'm going to uh, just download um, this data in Excel. Could also use CSV, which be, would be a nicer, I'll just um, click this now, which would be a nicer uh, open format. But as I'm going to be using Excel anyway to uh, to um, look at the data, I might as well, I might as well use it, uh, download it as, as Excel. Okay, so here's this information, this data in Excel. Um, I already had it open because it's a quite, it's, it's, a, it's a very large, uh, large file, so it takes a, a, some time to open it even in, in Excel. You have a look. Um, so this data seems to um, seems to include information on uh, for countries around the world um, on uh, for for each week on cases. Uh, also includes the population of that country, the population number, which is is handy if you want to to. Um, um, understand what this means for, for the country population-wise um, and uh, the rate of infection. And um, 
I'll make this a bit easier to, to look at. Um, these are the weeks, so I'll check the week 37, which I believe we're now in week 39, so that's two weeks ago. Fairly recent. I downloaded this on, on the weekend, that's, uh, that's why it's not, not from last week. Um, and here we see uh, for each country, it has uh, cases and deaths. Uh, so uh, cases weekly and deaths, uh, the rate, it has the population and it has uh, the country code, which can be helpful because if you look at the rest, it doesn't have geographical coordinates, geographical information apart from uh, the country and the country code. So. This seems like an interesting um, data set uh, to, to have a look at. And um, just to, to summarize, I uh, found this, this data set, downloaded it. Um, it contains no coordinates, no geometry, but it uh, includes a country code. So, um, we would now, if we want to combine this with um, uh, with the geometries of the countries to display it on a map, we would need to find uh, geodata with country codes. And again, for this, we're using um, the European Data Portal. And uh, Simon actually made a little, uh, a nice little um, um, recording of this. So I'll just. Um, Start this now. Uh, Europa.eu. Taking a different approach for the search now than I did before, searching for data sets. And um, as Simon is adding um, a search term called GISCO, and uh, that's the geographic information system of the European Commission from Eurostat. And um, there are different distributions here as well. And uh, the one he's uh, accessing now is uh, the HTML part, which excludes um, it's basically the, the, um, the part of the uh, Eurostat um, inter internet uh, homepage, which will show you what kind of um, data is available. And uh, we're here looking at administrative units and statistical units. And uh, there are all these different things like new uh, and uh, NUTS regions, um, and here we find the countries. So um, the countries um, are for different um, um, for different years. Of course, we want to uh, take the most current one, which is 2020. And they have different um, different formats that could be used, like shapefiles, uh, GeoJSON, SVG, uh, SVG, which is uh, scalable vector graphics, um, not specific to um, to um, geo information, but um, in this case, um, we're going to be downloading the GeoJSON to. Um, further use it uh, with the installation. OK, so I'm going to stop this. Now this is, uh, he's uh, basically now looking for the COVID-19 data and uh, also downloading that. But I've already showed you that live. So I'm going to stop this now. And um, move on to um, what to do next. So we've downloaded the COVID-19 um, situation data as JSON um, from the ECDC, from the European... Uh, oh no, I'm not going to be able to, <laughs> to, to, uh, to have the long name for, um, uh, for the ECDC, but uh, for the... Uh, European um, 
um, agency in, in charge of, of these disasters uh, prevention and things like that. So um, the EC, DC data has a country code um, for each, um, each individual um, object. And um, the GeoJSON from Eurostat that was uh, downloaded with the country areas also includes um, a country code. But you'll notice once in the one data set it's called country code and in the other one it's called ISO 3 code. Um, if we checked, they match. So um, what uh, we would need to do now in the, in the next step is to bring these data sets together and you can match them by matching country code from one data set to ISO code with the other data set. And um, how to do this? Um, there are actually lots of different ways to do this. Combining the, combining the data could be done in a lot of different ways and with different tools. Um, in this case, we are going to uh, show you with a uh, software called FME, which stands for Feature Manipulation Engine, which is a commercial software by a Canadian company called Safe Software. And um, but we, uh, what, what, what it actually does is um, it's an ETL tool. ETL stands for Extract, Transformation and Load. Um, and the reason we chose the software um, to demonstrate uh, what, what needs to be done uh, to combine these different data sets is uh, because we can go through the individual steps and then uh, to, to understand them and then run the process. So the in individual steps, of course, could be done in a different way or even manually. OK. And uh, if we have time, we will later show you a second approach to this. Um, but let's first uh, do, do the first one. And I'm going to, to open FME for this. Um, by the way, I'm no FME expert. I was just shown uh, how to do this um, uh, by a colleague in about uh, 15 minutes. Um, but let's say I want to create an, a KML file. That's the file that can be used in, uh, in Google Earth um, that can be displayed in Google Earth. Uh, and I want to use the COVID-19 situation data. So I basically, basically want, to, uh, want to have this COVID-19 situation data uh, on a map uh, so it can be explored and you can see what's, what's happening around, um, around the world. OK, so um, this is live now. I have, a, um, um, I have this um, FME workbench, which was pre prepared um, open. And I will just click on Run and then explain to you what's, um, what's being done. Wait. Great to say that I'm, I'm not an expert because it becomes obvious now. Um, it's uh, I just started again because uh, usually when when you um, start uh, when you started, it's being asked um, where the output and and input files are. And um, let me just do this quickly. So let me just show you. Um, this is the FME workspace that I'm starting now, and I have uh, some some input data, which is the GeoJSON that that was downloaded first, and then um, the national cases um, um, from um, from the ECDC. And um, when I click run, uh, I get these. Um, I, I'm asked which kind of uh, what what are the data sources that I want to 
input. So that's the GeoJSON here with uh, Eurostat's um, country um, areas. And uh, then it's these um, COVID-19 situation data from, um, from the ECDC. And uh, in this case, uh, I can, can choose, um, I could basically write it into any format that I need, but in this case, I want uh, KML. Um, and I'm going to write it into an output path and just click on run. And while this is happening, because it's quite a quite a bit of data that's that's being um, um, that's being um, read and and worked on right now, um, let's let's have a quick look at at what's being done. Um, probably need to need to zoom in a bit. So what's happening? Um, taking the JSON um, feature file, you could also um, take it from the web, basically, if you wanted to to do this uh, on a regular basis, like every every week. But this, in this case, we're just just using um, uh, using the normal input file um, just uh, from um, from my computer. And now uh, it's running these um, different tests, basically. Uh, to see if the um, if the data matches, and uh, to um, basically um, um, uh, analyze it in in different um, uh, in different ways, and calculating, for example, uh, the deaths uh, um, per um, uh, one hundred um, persons of the population. You might remember they had the population information in in the in the data, so this would be just one calculation to um, to make. And then um, we're taking the geo data from Eurostat, the um, geo JSON with the um, with the um, uh, with the um, geo coordinates for the different um, for the different countries, and we're basically putting putting it together. And um, after that, there's some some merging, and in the end, we are writing KML. And so um, the workspace um, is now finished. You can tell um, there's actually a log, but I, I, I won't uh, show it right now. But you can tell here by the uh, by the timestamp 10 1052 that was just now. And um, I'll now um, start Google Earth to um, to display it in the map. OK. So these yellow areas here, that's um, the new data. It's the KML file that was being um, that was was being um, transformed. I think we had a lot of Belgians here, didn't we? Let's have a look. So here we now have. Uh, before it was just. Um, uh, well, it wasn't KML in the first place, but before we didn't have this this combination of um, attributes um, and um, putting it uh, the geometry to put it uh, to put it on a map. So now we have the the combination of the two. Okay. So that was the um, the first approach I wanted to show you to to um, um, basically com combine um, the the data um, in this case with a with an ETL tool, and um, I'd like to show you a second approach. Um, this time. Um, uh, 
this time um, with the same data, COVID-19 situation data. This time we're using a CSV file, um, but the same uh, GeoJSON uh, with the country areas. And um, uh, in this case, it's, it's again mapped um, um, using the, the country code. So you know, basically, um, that's that's where where the different uh, the the individual uh, features are being uh, are being matched. So this second approach um, on how to combine the data, we're using uh, ArcGIS Online. And this is a, a commercial service by Esri. And the reason we chose ArcGIS Online for the second demo is that you, that you can do it online with no software to install. Um, we, we looked at other um, ways to, um, to demonstrate this, but it would usually have been a combination of different, um, probably also free tools, but uh, it would have been um, more difficult to follow. Um, so in this in this case we can show all the split, uh, all the steps including the visualization um, and for um, ArcGIS online if if you want to try this yourself there's a free developer account that could be uh, that could be used okay um, again here we have some um, some recordings which uh, Simon Yirka prepared. And the first one um, I'm going to start now is um, to upload the two data sets uh, into ArcGIS Online. He does this by dragging and drop, dropping uh, the COVID data CSV file. And um, uh, what's actually being done is that the, um, the uh, data is, uh, is uploaded and that uh, service is being um, created online this is because because we are we are working online and the data first needs to be uploaded so here simon is exploring the the data um, there's some things he uh, believes is not are not necessary that he doesn't doesn't need in this case uh, so these don't need to be imported um, and in this case, um, it's being asked, is there some some kind of uh, geo uh, georeferencing uh, in there? And um, because uh, ArcGIS Online offers um, also offers um, uh, geocoding, um, but but we wanted to use it with the two two different data sets. So um, this is why he says uh, no. There's no um, um, that that he's going to do it another way. OK, so he just inputs a name. This actually takes a while because the data set is uh, it's actually not complex, but uh, it's quite big because it includes all the uh, information uh, for, well, more than one and a half years now. And so now we have the CSV file uh, as a hosted table on ArcGIS Online. And um, now um, to, to take the second data set, which is the GeoJSON, and uh, which is also uh, uh, being uploaded here. There's the ISO 3 code that we're using for the matching. Um, and again, he needs to uh, give it a, a good title, give it some in information so um, we can, can find it again later. And this publishing of the service um, will also take one or two minutes. And now it can be uh, the, just the, the GeoJSON basically that was uploaded. The countries uh, can be uploaded, uh, can be shown on a map, and you can also change the, the styling, for example. But this is only the 
um, it, it doesn't include the COVID-19 data yet. So let's move on to do that. Let's move on. Combining the, um, the data sets on the map now to um, what's being done now is um, Z1 will add the two layers. First, the ECDC data with the, uh, with the COVID-19 data and the countries. Um, going to again have a look at it. So uh, the country's data, just, just to make sure that this doesn't include any COVID-19 information yet. It only includes the basically the name uh, name and different spellings and then the, the IDs and different spellings. And the COVID-19 data, it's um, only a table which can also be added to the map. Uh, and then explored, but it's not shown on the map. Uh, it's 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 only a table, which will um, which uh, Zimon will open now. Now again, we see um, that information that we looked at earlier in the, uh, in Excel has uh, these informations and it has the country code that we're planning to um, uh, that we're planning to uh, to combine. Mm -hmm. So here's the ISO code of the geo uh, information, the geojson of the countries. And to combine the two, um, well, there, there are different uh, analytical functionalities that could be used. And in this case, um, the plan is to join the feature. And here you select a target layer, in this case the countries, and then choose a layer to join that, that target layer. And then you need to map the fields, ISO code, ISO 3 code, and join it with the country code. So this is a step we, we, did, we did before in the, uh, in the FME as well. And now it's running an analysis. This um, actually takes takes a while. I think it takes about 30 seconds. But when you're watching it on the screen, it usually feels feels longer than that. Um, it's because um, the the data. Um, um, yeah, it actually also takes takes quite a lot of time uh, if you. Um, display it in a, in a browser if you display the, the uh, raw data. So um, if you've actually tried this, you might have noticed that uh, your browser will take a long time or even your notepad or whatever you're using will take a long time to actually display it. So now we have the result, uh, which is um, now you can, can click on the individual countries and you will have um, uh, you will have the uh, COVID-19 situation data. So last step, um, if you want to visualize, visualize um, um, the information in the map, because now it's all um, one, uh, one color, there's no uh, classification yet. Um, this is also possible in, in ArcGIS Online or in any, any other GIS you would be using. Um, so there are different options, either using um, like um, uh, charts or, or something or using a color scheme, which in this case um, uh, Simon is doing. Um, and here you can see which, uh, which countries are, uh, were or are uh, especially affected. So that was setting the symbology of uh, or the styling of the map. So to summarize, we um, found two datasets on 
data.europa.eu. The COVID-19 weekly situation update from ECDC. Uh, we um, actually uh, showed you two different ways um, of, of combining uh, the two data sets using different tools. Once we used um, JSON or as the uh, input format and once we used CSV, uh, common separated values um, file. Um, using this information, uh, this, this uh, CSV uh, without the um, coordinates. And we um, combined them with uh, country areas from um, Eurostat, which um, uh, the file format here was GeoJSON, but it's also offered in other formats like, like Shape um, or a file tree databases. And these countries areas contains the um, geometry and we com created uh, a new data set from the two sources. And we then display the data either the first um, uh, example was using Google Earth and the second one was in an online map. And um, to be clear, this can be done with lots of other tools. Most GIS will provide this kind of functionality uh, or all GIS will provide this kind of functionality. But I think it's important to understand the process, what, what needs to be done. And that was that was basically our message for we we're trying to we're trying to convey. So oh, are there any questions? Yes, so as you were uh, progressing with the demo, there have been some questions uh, put in, uh, but I believe most of them have been answered in the in the chat. Uh, already, oh, okay, great. Already. Mm -hmm. already. Uh, some of them uh, related to, indeed, as you already mentioned, some additional mm -hmm. uh, programs that could be used, uh, but you mentioned that is, of course, uh, the case. Mm -hmm. So there was some, some, some suggestions mentioned of, uh, of programs that would be useful here. Um, mm -hmm. There was also uh, the question by David on uh, when creating maps from, for example, shape files or GeoJSON, if there is a place uh, where we can download such files that respect EU officially recognized borders. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this is the one that you also used in your uh, example. Mm -hmm. That's actually an interesting question because you might have noticed, um, or if you're looking at the, the data now, which I believe some of you are, um, the data from um, ECDC also includes uh, um, information from um, countries that are not officially recognized by um, the European Union or anywhere um, internationally. Uh, so this will include, for example, I think Palestine and things like that. And this is this is something we we noticed um, that um, it would be difficult to actually map it to uh, an official source. Uh, and um, this is uh, so in that in those cases, it's, it's interesting to to look at the uh, original source, in this case, the, the ECDC. And let me just see if I can find the. Oh no. um, it's actually too too big to uh, to work with in a browser. Um, <laughs> But uh, you probably noticed that there are some um, some um, uh, countries that are not recognized countries and that will probably not be part of the um, um, of, of the data from Eurostat because of this. Okay, not sure if your question was getting there, but uh, it was something I, I thought it might might be good to mention. Hmm. Yes, thanks for your answer, Anche. I believe that was most of the questions related to the demo that you just uh, showed. Mm -hmm. Unless there are any new questions coming in in the chat or in the Slido. Mm -hmm. See, David thanking you for <laughs> answering his question. <laughs> That's always nice. Okay. All right, if there are no new questions, in the Slido, I think uh, we can still keep it open. So please, if you do have 
uh, further questions, feel free to post them and we can uh, address them also in the Q&A part mm -hmm. later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. I am great. Um, yes, we're, we're going to have a longer um, uh, questions and answers session after the second break. So um, please, please uh, keep adding your questions. Oh, ah, yeah, here's a uh, here's a tip from uh, one of the um, participants saying that there's an Excel add-in Power Queries. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you can actually do these things. You could do it in Excel. You could probably do it in uh, in a, in Notepad if you just uh, if if you want to just try out how it works. Uh, but it will definitely help to use some some kind of tool um, that will help. Okay. So and the other questions, I guess, will um, will um, um, will move to later. So let's move to, um, oh yeah, some people have already been um, been adding some, um, some input here. Um, our second question is um, that we'd like to discuss with you is, um, what challenges do you see with finding or using geospatial data? And um, so, while I was demonstrating it, I'm, I'm sure at some places you thought, oh, this is difficult or that I don't understand that. That that those could be challenges, of course, but maybe you've um, been using uh, geodata and, and you um, know of any challenges. So um, please, uh, please add anything you've um, come across or that you could think of. And um, the, the reason that um, we're very interested in your input here is that um, we can probably address some of these challenges either in the academy or um, making data.europa.eu, uh, making it somehow easier to use or adding stuff. So um, your input is very um, helpful here. Okay. All right, plenty of input coming in i see yes uh, yes it's uh, also um, very diverse very very interesting um, one thing i'd uh because it also has a question here a lot of data seems to be on the local scale where can i find data for my country um i think it's true because we're um we're harvesting um data from the national portals and uh, the national portals um, include all kind of data, all, all kinds of data, and lots of it is on the local scale because open data is often also on on the local scale. So um, it uh, could be the case uh, that you have a, an open um, data portal and you have um, I don't know a thousand data sets in it, and 300 come from one city. That's that's quite uh, that's that's not unusual, um, and I know for the um, for the geo uh, community, uh, especially from from Inspire, they've introduced a uh, spatial scale to um, to um, uh, distinguish between regional data and um, data that's actually for the whole of uh, member state. Um, I'm actually not sure if, if there's something com comparable on the um, open data in the uh, open data um, metadata, but it's definitely, um, let's say, one of the challenges I, I would I would see as well. Mm. Then here's a lot. How to know if the quality of the data is good and comparable, comparable about uh, across countries. That's what uh, people try to, um, um, yeah, try uh, try to address with metadata, uh, metadata standards that will, um, um, yeah, have uh, uh, forced the the. Um, the editors of these um, metadata to actually uh, give this information, and um, yeah, the directives such as Inspire have have done done a lot of um, 
um, a good work for uh, for at least the, the geospatial parts because uh, they're very strict about what needs to be included in the metadata and what doesn't. But it's an ongoing uh, uh, ongoing thing. Yeah, putting large and local scale data together, that's uh, definitely a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Most geospatial platforms are ugly and complicated, except data.europa. Oh, that's, that's nice to say. <laughs> okay. I think it's, it's very interesting to, to read through. Um, read through. Um, yeah, I think um, we should have a second break. And while you're at it, while you're probably having your coffee, <laughs> you can continue reading if you feel like it or just relax for five minutes. OK, so, so we'll be back at 11.25. Great. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Enjoy your coffee. Mm -hmm. See you in a bit. All right, I believe we can continue again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's do that. Um, we have a third uh, interactive poll basically to discuss. And that's um, right. the next one. And that's the question. That's the last question that um, you were sent with the invitation. Um, how could the reuse of geospatial data be encouraged? Um, and in the introduction, Esther mentioned that. Um, uh, one of the main goals of data.europa.eu is to encourage the reuse of data, of open data. And um, geospatial data, of course, is part of this, this, um, um, this, this general data to be included. But there might be some things that are also special to, um, to geospatial data. So um, we're quite interested on, in, in your ideas of um, what could be done to encourage um, the reuse of geospatial data. And also things like what, what would make your life easier if you were to use uh, geospatial data. So um, please don't be shy and uh, enter any of your ideas that, that you might have. It would, I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll it'll help us in uh, the process of um, developing data.europa.eu. Okay, either people are still on their break or <laughs> it's one of the tougher questions to answer. <laughs> yeah, I can also imagine that this is a tougher uh, question mm -hmm. indeed. Uh, what I could imagine is that some of your answers may stem from the previous question. So mm -hmm. what is currently challenging um, mm -hmm. can also be inspiration for how <laughs> you can encourage, uh, mm -hmm. uh, especially the reuse of it. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, here we go. Mm -hmm. I see some comments coming in. Think data. Higher quality metadata. Mm -hmm. I believe the first one that came in was interesting. I believe it was, I have no idea how to reuse <laughs> your spatial data. You could accept that challenge for um, the data.europa.academy to at least give an idea. I'm, hope, I'm hoping this. Um, um, this um, first webinar at least uh, set the first um, the first um, things to to set you on that path. Mm. Provision of proper metadata. Existing data should be um, easy to find via the different spatial catalogs to avoid inventing the deep plate again. 
Yeah, that's definitely metadata quality is definitely something we um, uh, we address with data.europa.eu. That's been an, on, an, an ongoing process. Yeah. Intuitive service surfaces of the platforms and high quality metadata. There's actually um, quite a few um, things on yeah, improving UX and UI yeah. um, user experience and uh, the user interfaces of geospatial data platforms. That's uh, definitely, I think, uh, a thing that um, that's been going on. I mean, um, this. Uh, it sounds like by some of your questions and some of some of your remarks uh, that uh, some of you aren't really, um, uh, let's say, newbies or <laughs> people who uh, who have not worked with geodata before. So, um, so you probably know um, the geoportals have gone a long way over the last few years, but there's still uh, quite a things, uh, a few things to do. And same, same for, in my opinion, same for the open data platforms. You know, while the first um, few years, the focus wa was on harvesting the data in the first place and getting it all together in one place, but that's um, that's not enough anymore. Yeah. Sharing success stories uh, of the reusers. That's that's, that's a very a good interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also mm -hmm. really really think that that's a great idea. So, mm -hmm. Geodata should be in standard formats that everyone can use. I totally agree here. Make it easier to download geospatial data. Yes, I know it seems trivial. Actually, I don't think it's trivial at all because <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's obviously one of the things that's uh, that's difficult to, to get right. Yeah. Advertise good examples, focus on interests of target group, make services more visible. Teach people how to reuse geospatial data. Yeah. Okay. So that is one for the academy, I would say as well. Yeah. Promote some pre-made data sets all nice and shiny, i.e. showing the end results to entice users. I like that one. <laughs> okay. Great. Nice. Yes. Thanks a lot. And uh I believe we're now moving over to um, the, the summary. Um, so to wrap things up, to, to summarize what um, we, we covered in this course, in this webinar. Um, first block was how to find and use geospatial data from data.europa.eu. Where does the geo metadata come from? Um, the harvesting of uh, the, the member states' uh, geo portals and uh, open data portals. Um, then we talked about formats for geodata and had a closer look at uh, GeoJSON and KML. Um, we quickly um, give an introduction to geo services like WMS or WFS and open uh, API features and the Inspire services. And then we uh, did a part on the use of indirect geospatial information using the country codes. We explored the COVID-19 weekly situation data and discovered that the country codes could be used to map it to data that has a um, that has geospatial data co coordinates, and we found a data set uh, with, uh, from Eurostat with countries that has this uh, geospatial data, and we merged, we combined these two data sets. And then you shared your ideas on the uses for geodata, which questions could be answered using geospatial data, the challenges for finding or using geodata, and how the reuse of geospatial data could be encouraged, which I think is uh, all great, great input for uh, our future work with data.europa.eu. 
So now um, we can move to the questions. Um, yes. See what questions haven't been answered yet. Um, yes, I believe that <clears throat> as of now, most uh, actually all of the questions that have been put in the Q&A part of Slido and in the chat have been uh, already answered. Um, so if you do have any further questions, please, uh, please put them, please put them in the chat or in the in the Slido so we can still discuss them. So if you have any further or any last questions for Anje, please feel free uh, to share them. Maybe in the meantime, there was uh, one question uh, and I believe Anje, you already touched upon it several times in your uh, in your uh, in your presentation, uh, the question is: How does the European Inspire uh, directive relate to Data Europa? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Even though you already touched upon it uh, several times, um, you can give it your yeah. view. Mm -hmm. So um, the Inspire directive promotes data sharing and it requires the EU member states to publish certain data sets following certain interoperability standards or principles. So and these uh, obligations for Inspire led to uh, a great number of data sets being made available and described with metadata and this metadata quality is generally, um, I think Inspire did, did a lot for metadata quality because it's just, um, yeah, has, has these, um, 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 yeah, these, these obligations. Um, and many of the national geoports are being harvested by um, data.europa.eu. And most of these are inspired geocatalogs because those are the, the official um, geo portals or uh, geo catalogs. Um, However, um, it would be um, wrong to assume that um, uh, the, the geo, that only Inspire uh, geodata is being harvested, because that's that's the main reason. Uh, there's a um, you might know that there's an uh, Inspire geo portal uh, on a European level, uh, and when um, the European data portal was first, um, uh, yeah. Dis discussed and specified. Uh, there was also a discussion going on on whether not to just uh, harvest that geo portal, the EU geo portal. Um, and uh, then this is uh, this is actually a few years ago, but the decision was made um, that uh, that wouldn't be um, um, that helpful because it would only include the, the Inspire metadata and not all um, geodata that might not be um, relevant under the INSPIRE directive. So this is why we harvest uh, the national geo portals. So that's the reason for that. Mm. Um, yes, so um, there's no direct connection, but uh, because we're using the um, the geo portals, uh, the national geo portals, as as one of the main data source. There's lots of uh, overlap and lots of uh, inspire information on data.europa.eu. All right. Thanks for your uh, for your view on uh, on that point. Um, let me double check the Slido and the chat. I don't see any new questions uh, coming in. Uh, unless people are not able to use the chat or Slido, also uh, feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. But I believe we have covered <laughs> most of the questions uh, up till now. Again, unless there are any new questions coming in. I think we can start uh, wrapping up uh, the session. Um, I would say for the last time, uh, please open up uh, Slido. And if you could please add 
uh, one line or one word on something that you, uh, on your experience of today, something that you learned in the session, something that you found interesting or something else that you would like to add or share. Um, please do so in the final uh, poll. It's open now. Oops. I believe we can pull that up. Well, is it activated? Could you open uh, the Slido once more, Ancha? Mm -hmm. No, it's not activated, but I'll try. Uh, right. Okay, here we go. I think there was more than one of us uh, trying to activate it. <laughs> Oops. All right, yes, so uh, when we are in the process of gathering that, uh, I hope that you will be able to, to have <laughs> learned something uh, in today's session. Uh, I can say for myself even already, I did. Um, and yeah, if there is anything else that you would like to share, please put it in the, in the Slido. I think we have some comments coming in already. Thanks a lot. Super interesting presentation. Always nice to hear the ones. And I also like here the, the interesting overview for me as a beginner in the field, because that is exactly what this uh, training was aimed for, to give you, let's say, the uh, broad introduction, uh, especially for those who, of you who have very little experience with geospatial data so far. Let's see what else that we have. Examples of using geospatial data, promoting the visualization of data in the EU institutions. That's also a pretty, pretty nice point uh, as a takeaway, because as is already mentioned, a picture says more than a thousand mm -hmm. words. All right, so thanks uh, for uh, sharing your, let's say, uh, final words on, uh, on leaving uh, this presentation. Looks all really good. Uh, and in addition to this final word on your experience, uh, we would also really uh, like to ask you to help us to improve uh, these trainings. Uh, we really do it for you, uh, and we would like to hear from you what you liked, and if you have any other pointers for improvements, uh, in a more uh, elaborate but still very short feedback form. <laughs> uh, you can use the QR code uh, on the screen and we will also post uh, the link to the survey in the chat. It will only take uh, two or three minutes uh, to fill it in and it will help us really uh, tremendously. Let's see if we can Post a link. So as we are well in time, I hope you can take the time directly to, to fill in the, the feedback form. And as you are doing that, I just want to give you one final uh, Reminder uh, that the Academy, like I said, is, is launched since the beginning of this week. And uh, please feel free to explore the Data Europa Academy 
and because this is where you will find uh, the materials uh, that are currently available and will also be updated with the latest research and upcoming trainings by the Data Europa uh, team. Uh, I believe we have covered uh, most of the questions and we know um, that not all the questions were answered uh, verbally, but most of them are already uh, answered in the chat. And if you have any lingering questions, please also feel free to contact us. And uh, that's uh, where I would like to end it. Uh, the recording and presentation slides of today will also be shared with you and also made available on the Academy. And on that note, I would like to thank uh, Antje for this uh, very interesting session and the rest of the team for preparing. And I also would like to thank all of you for uh, your time and participation today. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thanks.